sing about it, but I Hallelujah. 
song sheets stand in awe Welcome this morning, but I'm here to convince you that Jesus had, he literally had a, 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 he had, Jesus had convictions about welcome. In John chapter 2, in verse 37, it says, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And I believe the same question is being asked for all of humanity today. What do you want? We come to church and we desire something. You know, some come out of curiosity. We're like, okay, I was invited to church today. And and you got to ask yourself, you got to ask yourself the question today, what do you desire? Do you desire money? Do you desire friendships? Do you desire all these different things that the world is trying to give you? But we gotta ask ourselves the question today, why have we come to church? It's not out of religiosity, but it's out of the, it's out of the fact that we're here to worship Jesus, amen? amen? And again, Jesus has conviction because he, he asked the question, why? Because he just doesn't welcome anybody to church. It says, then, then he said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. I believe there's a lot of things that we can want from Jesus. A lot of people followed him for the miracles, to be healed, to to multiply food and all these different things. 
But again, only when Jesus heard that they wanted a relationship with him, he says, come and see. Come and see and come and be with me and I'll be with you. Come and I'll welcome you into my home. I believe we're a church that do not just, again, have private Christianity. We do not have closet Christianity. We're here, we're opening, up, we're opening our arms to everyone, showing ourselves who we really are as true disciples, amen? And today we have incredible, incredible speakers tonight come to give us the word of God. Visiting all the way from Brazil, the Brazil church, we have Renata Tria all the way from the Brazil church. Now, Renata has been a disciple since 1994. That's 29 years in the Lord. He was baptized in the ICOC, led a large, a, large, uh, a, a large region in the ICOC, left the ICOC, and now leads the Rio de Janeiro church in the Brazil church. And of course, he's got his beautiful daughter, Isabella, with, uh, with us today, you know, worshiping. She's right there. There she is. There she is. And he also obviously raised up our incredible prophet, prophet uh, Lucas Tria, preaching the word. You know, today he's going to be giving us the communion, which is going to be very special. And of course, we've been hearing Lucas preach the word in Portuguese for many weeks. But that's the son. And I, I put it before you that the father has come to preach the word today. And of course, for contribution, we have Victor O'Ching. And here to give us the keynote address, we have Michael Williamson, our father in the faith, to preach the word. You know, with this, I, I do not just want to welcome any religious people. We are here to worship Jesus Christ. We are here to give God the glory. So I need to know if you are here to worship God. I don't believe, that's a little bit. I don't believe that. I need to know if this church is here to worship Jesus Christ. And with that, I want to welcome you to the London International Christian Church Sunday service. And with that, I want to call on Jamie Gordine, our shepherd in the, West Re in the South region, to pray for us. Amen. Please bow your heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are very, very grateful, God, to meet as a church this morning, God. Lord, we seek your blessing today, Father. God, just as Moses blessed the people who built the temple, Father God. Lord, those who worked according to your direction, God, to put uh, the curtains together, God, to put the, the pieces together, Father God, to build your tabernacle. Lord God, we see your blessing today. God, we want you to salute us, God, for the work that you're doing through us, God. We're sinful people. We understand our weakness, God. We understand our flaws. God, we understand that we can do nothing without you. And yet, amazingly, God, miraculously, God, you are using us, God, to build your tabernacle here in Europe, Father God. And I want to give you glory and honor, Father God, for allowing us to do this incredible task. Father, God, we pray, Father, that the plans, Lord, that we have, God, are according to your plans. God, I pray, Father God, that we can implement them, Father. Lord God, I pray, just as we've already planted Paris, Father God, we've planted Stockholm, God, we've planted Amsterdam and Berlin, Father God, we've planted Warsaw and Kiev, Father, and Brussels, Father. God, you've done amazing things, God, through Michael and Michelle, God, through their valiant and faithful leadership, God, in the last decade. Lord God, and I know that you want to do incredible things, Father. God, the way all of a sudden, God, you've made it apparent, Father, God, that uh, Lisbon, Father God, Lisboa in Portugal, Father God, should be planted. God, and we pray for um, Giuliano and Tatiana, Father God, who are out there right now, God, and for the incredible good work, God, that you're doing, God, through the Portuguese-speaking ministry here in London, Father God. Long may it continue, God, rapidly may it continue, God. God, we seek your blessing, Father, for that. God, we pray for, for Barcelona, Father God. Lord, we pray for Spain, Father God, for our family down there, for Rome, Father God. Lord, for Athens, God, we pray for Bucharest and Budapest, Father. God, that you make it apparent, God, that you identify those here in London, Father God, who speak those languages, God, who have the heart, Father, to go out there and lead those chances, God, surface those hearts, God, bring them to us, Father God. 
so that we can teach the Bible, God, adequately, God, correctly, God, Lord, to make disciples of all nations, God, and send them out, God, because this is your plan, God, not for just for a church in London, God, not just for a church, God, across the home counties of the UK, Father, but for across Europe and the world, Father. God, thank you so much, God, for this incredible charge that you've given us, God, and please be with us, God, as we try and put this together. God, thank you so much, God, for the church here in London, God, for the service today, God, that we can worship you, Father, God. Lord, that we can praise you, God, that we can sing to you, God. We can acknowledge, Lord, that you are our God and our Father. You are holy, Father, God. You've called us to be holy, God. Indeed, you've made us holy, God, by the blood of your Son. God, thank you so much, God, for the sacrifice that you've provided, which enables us to come to communion with you. Lord God, I pray, Father God, for our dear friends, God, who are amongst us, God, who need help, Father God, who are going through difficult times, God, trials, Father God, physical illnesses, God. Lord, we pray for our dear friend and our sister, God, a friend of, of, of mine and Hillary's personally, God, Heather, Father God. Lord, I pray for her health, God. Please, please perform a miracle, God, with her, God. Lord, we pray for our, our noble God and esteemed leaders, God, the, 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 the men and, and women, God, that you, you've uh, put in charge, Father God, of our movement, Father God, for Kip and Elena, God. Pray especially for Elena right now, God. She needs our prayers, Father. She needs you to work miracles, God, in her life, Father. Lord, I pray for her, God. I pray that you uh, just uh, give her strength, God. Give her courage, Father God, uh, and, and give her faith, Lord, that she needs, God, uh, just to get her through these times, God. Lord God, uh, thank you for being with us, God. Thank you for choosing us, God, to be here today, God. Thank you for the visitors that have come out for the first time, Father. Lord, I pray that they see you, God, in our worship, God. They see you in our fellowship, God. They see you, Father God, as we aim to give you the glory, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Miriam Okanlawa, and alongside my husband, we serve the mighty North region of the London International Christian Church and the campus ministry. This is my radiant sister, Rachel, my radical sister, Roxana. We are the Sisters of Encouragement here to bring you the announcements. Amen. The first announcement is that at 2.30 p.m. right here, we're going to be having our first principles class. And this is one you don't want to miss. It's going to be on feeling. There's going to be a Bible study on feelings, shortly followed by the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. I kind of want to be there for that, but um, 2.30 p.m., um, we're going to have first principles class led by Michael. Thank you. Good morning, church. I'm Roxana, and I serve in the singles ministry. Do we have any mighty men of God in the house? They seem like they are here. Great. <laughs> this Wednesday, there's going to be men's midweek. If you're a man and you'd like to join, please reach out to the person who invited you for more details. Oh, Amen. Thank you, sisters, for those announcements. So my name is Rachel. Alongside my husband, we serve in the cyber ministry in the south region of the London International Christian Church. And the next announcement is that alongside the first principles classes happening at 2.30 p.m., we'll also be having our Bible Talk Leaders meeting spearheaded by Sean the Baptist, who is the leader of the West region. And so if you're a Bible Talk leader, please come to Bible Talk Leaders meeting. Thank you. Amen. And for the final announcement, we're going to be having the Good News Network. Now, for those of you that don't know what the Good News Network is, we are not just a local community church. We are an international movement across all six populated continents of the world. And this Good News Network is the collected effort of almost 12,000 disciples across the movement put together in a network for you to enjoy. Thank you.
Hello, family, and welcome to season four, episode seven of the Good News Network. Reporting from beautiful Miami, Florida, I'm Luke Speckman. And I'm Brandon Speckman. And today we'll be chronicling just a few of the countless blessings that God has poured down on our worldwide family of churches, the International Christian Churches, this past month entitled March Gladness. Now today, we'll start off with an update on the first Southern Africa Missions Conference hosted this past month in Johannesburg, and follow that with special announcements coming from Sold Out Press International. Later, we'll see a mercy moment and a day in the life of our dear sister here in the Miami church, Melina Harrison. Then will come the always faith building good news from around the world. Finally, I'm so excited to close with very special highlights of the women's days across the globe. And so let's begin with good news from the Africanist world sector led valiantly by Dr. Andrew and Patrick Smelly. The first ever Southern Africa missions conference entitled God is Able was held in Johannesburg South Africa on March 7th through March 9th. Disciples across South Africa and the world, including 14 disciples from the Washington DC Church, the Africanist Pillar Church, joined together in worship, fellowship, and a life-changing time of learning from the scriptures as they continue to carry out their part of Operation Motherland to evangelize the 10 countries of Southern Africa. Throughout these few days, disciples experienced a delicious welcome banquet, elephant walks, cultural dances, and moving charges from guest speakers and European world sector leaders, Michael and Michelle Williamson. At the Sunday worship service, some of the highlights were the conference keynote sermon, which was delivered powerfully by Maputo Mozambique mission team leader, Yuri Oliveira, the baptism of a campus student named Akuna, the appointment of Nick Wynn as evangelist in God's kingdom, and the sending out of the Maputo mission team. Of special note, Mozambique is the first Portuguese speaking African nation to be planted, which now takes the movement into three of the 10 Southern Africa countries. Congratulations to our forceful advancing Africanist family. What an incredible victory. And now we have two special announcements from the Sold Out Press International, followed by our always encouraging Mercy Moment. Greetings from Sold Out Press International. We have two very exciting announcements. The first being the release of an audible version to one of our well-loved publishings. Dr. Tim Kernan's 2020 Book 3, 20 More Convictions in 20 Days for everyone who wants to get stronger and be empowered. With this audible version, you'll be able to listen to this insightful biblical teaching wherever you are in the voice of Dr. Tim Kernan himself. Alongside that, Sobe is thrilled to share that the historic articles, Revolution Through Restoration 1, 2, and 3, written by Dr. Kit McKean, in 1992, 1994, 2003, respectively, have been re-edited and bound and are now available for purchase. This publishing details firsthand the miracles, the heroics, and setbacks that led to the spirit creating the Boston ICOC movement and in time, the Portland ICC movement. These articles continue to bring into the new movement scores of ICOC remnant disciples all royalties go to the Mercy McKean Scholarship Foundation, named in honor of Kip's parent. You can now find these incredible books and add them to your personal Soapy library by going to Amazon.com and to God be all the glory. Mercy Ambassadors, Nick and Denise Bordieri here. We're excited to announce a contest for the best video submitted by you for Mercy Worldwide. The rules are simple. Create a one to two minute video highlighting our theme, which is compassion is action. And be creative, have fun, or be serious. You decide. But submit it by July 1st to me at Denise at MercyWW.org. Excitingly, the winner will be showcased at the ICLS conference in Chicago at the Mercy Night. We are so excited to see what you submit.
Thank you so much for that exciting Mercy Moment. We are so excited for our upcoming International Day of Mercy on June 15th. This is always preceded by our International Day of Fasting for Mercy. This year, it's on June 14th. And family, now we'll turn it over to our exemplary sister, Melina Harrison, who serves alongside her amazing husband as the Sage's World Sector Administrator couple. This is a day in the life of Melina. on December 10, 1995. Last year I wasn't feeling well and um, I had a doctor appointment because I was feeling super tired and I didn't know what was wrong with my body. So they ran some tests and then uh, one day I was on my way to a Bible study and the doctor called me and say that I have cancer. And the type of cancer that I have is a rare cancer. There's no treatment for it. And so for me, it was more like, wow, God, I think this is it for me. So uh, the next day after the news, that was the most difficult day for me. I cried the whole day. The thing that was the most difficult for me was thinking about Yvonne and Loa, that I'm not ready to leave them yet. So the type of cancer that I have, there's no specific treatment for it and the doctor don't have the answer. Usually people um, with this type of cancer just last for a few months, maybe a year. So my treatment is uh, immunotherapy right now, and I do it like every four weeks, and it has to be for a year. I already done six, uh, six treatments, so I have seven more to go. And that affect my life. Um, every day is different. Like. It is hard for me to plan a week, um, you know, or ahead of time, because I don't know how my body's gonna react after the treatment. So usually, sometimes it's pain the next day or pain, pain the, ne the, the week after. So after the diagnosis is when I made the decision to be close to God, and that's when um, God provide all these women that wanted to study the Bible and open the heart of many of them. So last year I was um, personally fruitful three times, but I helped in total six women to become a disciple. God gives me, gives me the hope and also all the prayers from everybody. I don't know what's going to happen with my life. I know that God is with me and He's going to help me through everything. So one thing that I learned going through all of this was that even though physical pain was there all the time, God still can use me. And for me, when I think about women that need, need God, that's what gave me the strength to go after and help women to know Him and be with Him. I think that's, that's for me is something refreshing, it's something that gave me strength to keep going. Even though I don't know what's gonna happen with my life in the future, I just wanna give my 100%, 110% for God because He's everything for us. And He's so faithful that I know that even if I'm going through a hard time, He's always there and we have a spiritual family that is always there too. Thank you, Melina, for sharing so vulnerably about your inspiring testimony and your life as a disciple of Jesus. We're so immensely proud of your example of faith and perseverance, and so glad to have you and Devon as dynamic leaders here in the Miami Church. Let's all continue to pray for Melina's health. And now we have good news from around the world. First, an update about the upcoming AMS and Singles Leadership Seminar and the European Missions Conference. Due to the Olympics being in Paris this year in 2024, the location of these back-to-back -back conferences officially has changed from Paris, France to Barcelona, Spain. And with this change, all in attendance will not only get to experience what is sure to be two glorious conferences, but also witness the inaugural service for the Barcelona International Christian Church on the Sunday service on October 27th of the European Missions Conference. How exciting this is going to be. Please pray for Anthony and Cassidy almost as they direct the EMC and lead the Barcelona mission team. And speaking of the AMS, all the way in the Los Angeles church, we have the story of Kennedy, a talented actress and one of the stars of a 
the very popular YouTube series, Darman, with over 13.9 billion views. Yes, 13.9 billion. What a joy to see that on March 24th, this prominent young woman gave her life fully to Christ and was buried in the waters of baptism as a true disciple of Jesus. Congratulations, Kennedy, and welcome to the family. Additionally, another baptism very special to the LA Church was that of Aaliyah. Aaliyah is a teen and the third generation of the Kelly family to get baptized, making this the 14th member of this very special family to become a disciple. Welcome to the kingdom, Aaliyah. And more family baptisms trumpeting from the Latin America world sector. In Mendoza, Argentina, the church recently celebrated their first year anniversary. And to the joy of all that were in attendance, they closed out their Easter Sunday service with Alfredo Jr., the son of church leaders Alfredo and Alejandra Anuch, declaring Jesus as his Lord and Savior and being baptized at 13 years old. And finally, from the tribe world sector, in their pillar church of Dallas, Texas, we have David Kernan. David Kernan, the son of Tribe World Sector leaders, Drs. Tim and Leanne Kernan, is known and loved by so many, and so heaven and earth rejoiced as he was baptized by his family Saturday, March 16th, uniting the entire four-member Kernan family in Christ. Oh, we are so happy for each of you. What a blessing to see so many physical families transformed to become spiritual families as well. Astoundingly, the European World Sector had 20 additions in the last two weeks of March. We'd like to highlight the Oxford House Church, which has a campus outreach to one of the highest ranking colleges in the world, Oxford University. There were two baptisms on Easter Sunday. A special note, Sean is a 17-year-old Hungarian and Guyanese student studying at Precision Football College in Oxford. Sean was forceful with his Bible studies, making no excuses as he left an ungodly relationship to be baptized and join the fight for souls in Oxford. Sean is fired up to make disciples in Oxford and already has two friends studying the Bible as well as his ex-girlfriend. And over in our shepherding world sector, where our movement shepherding couples continue to flourish and aid the strengthening of each and every church, the esteemed leaders of this world sector are Tony and Therese Antelon, who reside in LA, but who recently made a shepherding visit to Hilo, Hawaii, Sydney, Australia, as well as their birthplace of Guam. Amazingly, Tony and Therese were first reached out to and baptized by the ICOC mission team that came to Guam over 30 years ago. Then, years later, they were among the 25 Portland Disciples in 2003, where the Spirit sent Kip and Elena McKean. This group would grow to nearly 500 disciples and formally initiate the Sold Out Movement in 2007. The Untalans became instrumental in forming the Guam ICC Remnant Group on March 28, 2010, through Teresa's sister and her husband, John and Bernie Pareda. And so, what an absolute blessing for the Untalans to visit the Guam Church, now dynamically led by Rico and Janelle Jones, and to encourage the disciples there that they have known for years. Dr. Michael and Sharon Kirshner also made a shepherding visit all the way to India and were able to stop in New Delhi as well as Bangalore to attend their phenomenal Women's Day. We're so grateful for these wise, generous, and hardworking couples who are willing to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything to uplift the spiritual family. So amazing. And we have a few big milestones hit in our global family this past month. On March 24th, the New York City Disciples initiated their Spanish-speaking ministry. And with 25 disciples, God gave them 52 in attendance. Wilfredo, a Columbia University student and zealous disciple, preached a fiery sermon in Spanish. Way to go, New York City. Of course, since the New York City women's ministry leader, G. Blackwell, is Dominican, her awesome husband, Corey, alongside G, disciple this new fast-growing ministry. And more good news from the Jerusalem Church of the Movement, the City of Angels Church in Los Angeles. During March Gladness, the Lord blessed this model church with 73 additions, 69 baptisms, and four restaurants. They now stand at 1,128 disciples strong with 1,300 in attendance on Sundays. Wow. Dr. Jason and Sarah Dimitri are doing a tremendous job leading this thriving congregation through their Company of Prophets program and Preachers Academy, which integrates the International College of Christian Ministries into their leadership training. Now over in Toronto, charismatically led by Evan and Kelly Bartholomew, the church had a record 12 baptisms for March and had their highest attendance ever at their Easter service with 175 souls worshiping God together. And in Latin America, specifically in Sao Paulo, the church had 31 additions in March's 31 days. That's daily additions. So awesome. 
The USA sector of the Latin America world sector is on fire, not only in LA, but also in San Francisco. This great congregation also reached a huge milestone as the church hit 450 sold out disciples. What a miracle, and we know God will continue to bless them as they are now on the road to 500. So amazing. Now here in the Miami church, we are so humbled to share the growth God has given. From January to March, with 46 baptisms, we've seen the church grow from 183 to 218 disciples strong. We love you and are so proud of you, Miami family. And our final milestone is that in the nine nations of French Africa with international Christian church congregations, the angels celebrated an astounding record harvest for March gladness of 142 additions, 137 baptisms, and five restorations. The overseeing French Africa ministry couple, Dr. Blaise and Patricia Fumba, report that the two largest churches are Kinshasa Democratic Republic of the Congo at 717 disciples and Abidjan Ivory Coast at 655 sold out members. So in total, we have almost 2,400 disciples in French so Africa. So incredible. Now, March Gladness was, without a doubt, filled with so much fantastic news. And along with that, March was also Women's History Month. And so, to close out today's episode, we want to take a few minutes to highlight the spirit working in the glorious Women's Day events hosted across the globe. First, in Sages, led passionately by Drs. Matt and Helen Sullivan, we have the awe-inspiring churches of South Asia. In the Kathmandu Nepal Church, led bravely by Earl Rigdon and Megan Matthews, the eight sisters of the Kathmandu Church and three visiting sisters welcome 67 visitors. That's seven visitors for every one disciple. They had special performances and welcomed keynote speaker Dr. Colleen Chalinar of New Delhi, who preached their theme, Treasured. And in the New Delhi church, with the same theme, God powerfully paved the way for them to have 151 in attendance with 110 visitors. The New Delhi Women's Day opened with a stunning dance performance, international prayer, and after some amazing testimonies and a lesson delivered by Colleen, they close with a scrumptious buffet and raffle. We're looking at this incredible celebration. God is working powerfully through his treasured possession in India. And moving into Africa, in Abidjan, the sisters had their Women's Day theme, He Told Me Everything I Ever Did from John chapter 4, verse 29. Their guest speaker was Marianne Kaku, an Ivory Coast national converted in LA, who after graduation returned to Abidjan to become a full-time intern. She challenged the audience to run after a relationship with Jesus, which is the only thing that can truly satisfy us. God tremendously blessed their Women's Day as the 244 sisters had 590 in attendance and closed with eight baptisms and one restoration. So amazing. And moving over to Tana, Madagascar with the same theme as Abidjan, we have quite a story to share. After many weeks of prayer, fasting, and a daily door-to-door -door evangelistic campaign to rally the Samaritan women of the city, God's glory came down in an unprecedented way. 25 sisters had 326 women in attendance. One sister, Vivienne, led the way and personally had 100 guests with her. And our dear sister, Narina, had 85 friends in attendance. Their afternoon ended with three glorious baptisms. What an incredible example of faith and hard work. Now over in the tri-world sector, led by esteemed doctors Tim and Leanne Kernan, there is the Dallas-Fort Worth Church, which had its Women's Day with over 100 in attendance. Dr. Leanne Kernan was their speaker, and they closed with two beautiful baptisms. Also in tribe, over in Southeast Asia, the five regions of Manila hosted four different Women's Day events entitled Brand New. And indeed, many hearts were made new through God's Word. With 252 sisters, they had a cumulative attendance of 762 women. Micah Carbonell and Anna Malnegro of Manila, as well as Cielo Perez of Bangkok, were the keynote speakers for these events. And they had three beautiful baptisms. In the Austral China World Sector, led by spirit filled Dr. Joe and Carrie Willis, the Sydney Australia Church had their Women's Day themed the power of purity, which was located in the gorgeous Valcluse Sydney house that was celebrated with a delightful high tea. Latin America World Sector leader Linda Moreno shared a message that moved many women's hearts. And finally, the Sisters of Sydney introduced Ndibo, a first year medical science student at the University of Sydney. A few weeks ago, in the midst of her prayers for a deeper understanding of the Bible, Ndibo encountered the disciples and promptly attended the Bible talk that following day. 
Despite her religious background, Ndebo exhibited great humility in approaching the scriptures, ultimately deciding to release any prior beliefs that did not align with the teachings of the Bible and choosing to become a baptized disciple of Jesus. Her baptism before the 100 plus others in attendance served as a powerful inspiration to many women. Now over in the Promised Land World sector, led by Corey and G. Blackwell, the Sisters of Syracuse, New York, hosted their Women's Day Set Free. It was superb. The mighty women's ministry of the Syracuse Church, inspired by Dave and Jill Swan, and which is one of the original churches to first join the new movement, 30 sisters had over 100 in attendance and all enjoyed the skillful vocal performances and brave testimonials of those on stage. Boston Women's Ministry Leader and former Jean and staff, Alyssa Swan, served as their keynote speaker, preaching a heartfelt lesson. They ended in the best way, setting free two precious souls in the waters of baptism. Now let's visit the Northern Federation World Sector, led by Dr. John and Emma Kazi. The Detroit, Michigan Church celebrated their third Women's Day since their team was planted almost three years ago. Just two weeks before their Women's Day, they had only three visitors registered. And so, the Detroit Women's Ministry Leader, Julie Clark, rallied the only 27 sisters to much prayer and fasting for God to work miracles. God blessed the sisters with a total attendance of 147 women, about five for one visitors, proving that God can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. And additionally, just days before the event, God blessed them through the generous donation of food that fed all in attendance. God is good. Now also in the Northern Federation, in Chicago, the sisters have been marching on to victory in the month of March and their Women's Day, I Am Her, inspired, was truly unforgettable. The Lord gathered together 420 in attendance, and what they witnessed was nothing short of inspiring. The Women's Day was especially historic because the inspired vision of Emma Kazi to write and direct an entire musical aided by C.L. Pinedo as the composer of the music and Ashley Campbell as the lyricist. It was simply miraculous to watch so many gifted sisters come together to craft and put on a captivating show, along with testimonies, a keynote, and six souls plunged into the waters of baptism and raised to a new life. Let's take a look at the musical. Beautiful. All right, one final piece of Women's History Month news comes from the dynamic and talented biological and spiritual sisters in the AMS Ministry of LA, Kristen Smith and Chantelle Anderson. These dynamic women recently released a spiritual podcast geared toward women called Go Sis. They have been trailblazers in the AMS ministry. On March 7th, they were invited to speak at a Women's Day event at Crypto Arena, a massive arena in downtown Los Angeles. Also, in their time there, Kristen and Chantel received the Women of Impact Award from LA Kings and the Elite Network. Come on, go sis, let your bright light shine. It has indeed been a month of miracles and eternal impact all over God's kingdom in the month of March. We can't wait to see you again soon and share with you all the good news for April, which has been entitled April Fools for Christ. Please be sure to share the March Gladness episode with your friends and family so they too can marvel over what has been a spectacular month from the Lord. This is Luke and Brandon Speckman reporting to you from the Good News Network. The best news you'll ever see.
Greetings from the church in Rio de Janeiro. Para mim é uma honra muito grande estar aqui em Londres. For me it's a great honor to be in London. Eu me sinto em casa aqui, não? I feel home. Eu acho que Eu me sinto em casa primeiro porque existem discípulos aqui, amém? First I feel home because there's disciples here, amen. E também porque Londres é a cidade, é a igreja que mais tem brasileiros fora do Brasil. And also because London is the church with most Brazilians outside of Brazil. Sou muito grato a Michael e Michel. Very grateful to Michael and Michel. Sem dúvida, essa igreja é incrível, essa igreja é fantástica para Deus por causa do relacionamento com Deus que Michael e Michel têm. No doubt, this is a great, incredible church because of your relationship with God. Mas esse é o momento da Santa Ceia. But this is the moment for communion. Normalmente, na Santa Ceia, nós costumamos a falar de nossos pecados antes de sermos discípulos. Normally, during communion, we usually talk about our sins before becoming a disciple. Mas eu quero falar de um pecado específico depois que eu me tornei um discípulo. But I want to talk about a specific sin after I became a disciple. É claro que a minha vida, of course my life, antes de ser discípulo era péssima. As before a disciple was terrible. Como a vida de qualquer pessoa que não tem Deus. Just as anyone who does not have God. Eu bebia muito até cair. I used to drink a lot till fall down. Eu tinha relacionamentos sexuais com muitas mulheres. I had sexual relationships with women. Eu tinha arrumava muitas brigas em estádios de futebol. I used to fight in uh, soccer stadiums. Mas existe um pecado hoje. But there's a sin today. Que eu me envergonho dele. That I'm ashamed of. Quando eu fui batizado em 1994. When I was baptized in 1994. Eu pensei assim, ok, os meus pecados acabaram. I thought, okay, my, my sins are, are, are done. Agora eu vou ter uma vida tranquila ao lado de Deus. Now I have a calm life on, on God's side. Esse é o principal engano de um cristão novo, não? This is, is, is uh, the main deceit of a new disciple. Achar que nunca mais vai pecar. To think that you're never going to sin anymore. Mas... No meu coração, in my heart, existe um pecado a sin que eu luto todo dia contra ele. That I struggle every day against it. Que é o comodismo. Which is to love, love being comfortable. Eu amo estar confortável. E eu gosto de coisas tranquilas. I love being comfortable. And I love uh, things that just are relaxed. Eu gosto de não ter muitos problemas na minha vida. I don't like to have a lot of problems in my life. Eu detesto WhatsApp. I hate WhatsApp. <laughs> Toda, todo dia que eu acordo, every eu, day I wake up. Eu penso assim, eu vou ter que olhar meu WhatsApp. I think I have to look at my WhatsApp. Isso pode ser engraçado, mas isso é típico de quem gosta do conforto. 
This can be funny, but this is sinful and it's typical of someone who loves comfort. Todo dia eu tenho que acordar preparado para a batalha, carregar minha cruz e negar a mim mesmo. Every day I need to be ready for battle. I need to carry my cross and deny myself. Mas em alguns dias eu durmo mais do que eu precisava. But many days I sleep more than I need. Algumas outras vezes eu desmarco tempos de discipulado porque eu gosto de conforto. Sometimes I cancel D times because I love comfort. Isso é terrível. Isso This faz com que não só a igreja não cresça por liderar a igreja do Rio de Janeiro, mas também que eu não cresça espiritualmente. This is terrible because not only Rio de Janeiro Church does not grow because of this, but I do not grow because of this. E infelizmente os brasileiros no Rio de Janeiro são conhecidos como preguiçosos. And unfortunately, the people from Rio de Janeiro are known as being lazy. E eu tenho caído nesse pecado não poucas vezes. And I did not fall into that sin just a few times. Mas existe uma escritura But there's a scripture que me anima muito that a vencer esse pecado. Inspires me to e win eu tenho que me lembrar dela todos os dias. And I have to remember the scripture every day. Se eu quero sair do meu comodismo. If I want to get out of my comfort zone. Vamos, vamos comigo para Apocalipse 5, do 1 ao 14. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5, verse 1. I'll be reading till 14. The Bible says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth opened the scroll or even looked inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb. Looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a, uh, had a harp, and they were holding golden boughs full of incense, which are prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and a nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. O Apocalipse nos revela muitas coisas. Revelation reveals us many things. Mas a principal coisa que Apocalipse me revela é o sacrifício de Jesus. But the main thing that the Revelation reveals to me is the sacrifice of Jesus. E uma coisa que me chama a atenção aqui é que Jesus é comparado a um leão por seres espirituais, por And seres superiores. And something that brings my attention is that Jesus, Jesus is compared to a lion by the superior beings. O único ser espiritual digno de abrir o livro. The only spiritual being who's, who, who, who can open the scroll. Mas Jesus que é visto como um leão no céu. But Jesus who's seen as a lion in heaven. Aqui na terra ele foi visto como cordeiro. Here on earth he was seen as a lamb. Jesus ele saiu da sua posição de leão. Jesus left his position as a lion. Para estar numa posição de servo. To be in a position of a servant. De alimento espiritual, de pão da vida, do cordeiro. Of a spiritual food, of the bread of life as a lamb. Aqui na terra. On earth. Ele se diminuiu tanto que coube numa manjedoura. He, 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 he minored himself so much that he could fit in a manger. 
Ele parecia estar morto. He seemed dead. Porém, ele precisou passar por tudo isso. But he had to go through all of this. Para que pudesse ter uma posição celestial de leão. So then he can have a celestial position as a lion. Se eu quero ser um leão, if antes I, eu preciso ser um cordeiro. If I want to be a lion before I need to be a lamb. E o que é ser um cordeiro? And what is to be a lamb? É ser uma, uma pessoa frágil? Is it it's to be weak? Não. No. É ser um servo. It's to be a servant. Se eu quero ser um leão aos olhos espirituais de Deus, If I want to be a lion through the, through the spiritual eyes of God, eu preciso ser um servo aqui nesse mundo, servir não somente à igreja, mas servir aos perdidos. I need to be a servant here on earth to be seen as a lion to God. I need to serve the lost. I need to serve the church. Isso é ser um discípulo de Jesus. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. E quando eu me lembro disso, and when I remember this, eu me envergonho dos meus pecados, especialmente do comodismo. I'm ashamed of my sins, especially eu fico my animado para sair do comodismo. I, I get inspired by this to leave my comfort zone. Porque Jesus saiu de uma posição superior. Because Jesus left his superior por causa position. do meu pecado. Because of my sin. E vendo a igreja aqui em Londres, and to see the church in London, eu fico muito animado, muito inspirado porque eu vejo aqui servos de Deus. This inspires me because I see servants of God. Eu não tenho dúvida que eu vou voltar para o Rio de Janeiro. No doubt I'm going to go back to Rio. Animado, inspirado. Inspired. Deus me trouxe aqui. God brought me here. Deus trouxe meu filho aqui e minha filha. God brought my son and my daughter here. Para me ensinar to teach me a ser servo. To be a servant. E com isso, irmãos, With eu gostaria de uh, compartilhar um pouquinho da minha vida e gostaria também de uh, dizer que amo muito vocês e eu sei que Deus tem planos incríveis para cada um de nós I know that God has amazing plans for each one of us. por isso precisamos meditar na cruz this e meditar need... sempre no sacrifício de Jesus Cristo this one we need to meditate on the cross and meditate in Jesus sacrifice always I'll pray in Portuguese Deus e Pai, muito obrigado pelo seu amor, pela sua justiça, pelo seu perdão. Anima-nos, Deus, sempre a estarmos ao seu lado. Que Jesus Cristo, Pai, sempre seja a pedra fundamental que precisamos para servir as pessoas com todo o nosso coração. Obrigado por tudo, obrigado pelo seu amor, obrigado pelo sacrifício de Jesus. Que tudo seja para a sua honra e para a sua glória. Em nome de Jesus. Amém. Thank you so much, Renato, for that communion speech. As the trays are passed around and we reflect on the message we just heard, we'll be singing Humble Yourself in the Sight of the Lord. 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 Ten thousand years when we've 
been there, when we've been there 10,000 years. Rise, shining as the sun. Rise, shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise. We've no less days. We've no less days to sing God's praise. In the sight of the Lord, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Obrigado, Tria, por uh, falar sobre a cruz. Uh, uh, thank you, Michael and Michelle, for this opportunity to preach what sacrificial giving to God is, uh, but also just for the privilege of serving the European world sector as administrator. And, and this will be impossible without all the admins who do a lot of work behind the scenes. For those who don't know me, my name is Victor, uh, married to my beautiful wife, Krista. Uh, it's going to be 10 years this year, and, and we've got three beautiful, wonderful, handful kids. Let's talk about sacrificing to God. Imagine this scenario. What if each of us were given suddenly one million pounds right now? Will we give it cheerfully to God or hesitate? Will this be the last time we see your church? Oh. You know, in 1 Corinthians, if you turn there, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, Paul actually gives us like an incredible example and a warning from the Old Testament. And he actually talks about the Israelites when they're actually freed from captivity and they were given something better than one million pounds. They were given a chance to have a relationship with God and also to be led to the promised land. Let us see what they did. First Corinthians chapter 10 from verse one. It says, for I do not want you to become ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized to Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. And the church said? Amen. As you notice, Paul uses the word all a lot. I checked in Hebrew, in Greek, and in English. All means all. 
all means everyone. And it's quite amazing that it actually says, even though they had the same experiences, saying that they all were under the pillar of cloud by the day, they all passed through the sea, they all were baptized to Moses the same way we actually get baptized into Christ Jesus. And they actually all ate the same food. They were on the same diet. Just as us disciples, we are on the same diet. Amen? Yeah. But sometimes this same diet can actually be stale. And to some people, it can be fresh. And they actually drank from the same spiritual drink. You have a sense that they all share the same experiences, the same way we also can share the same experiences. As the London Church, and I'd like to call it the capital of the European world sector, we've had a lot of miracles in the first 90 days of this year. We have shared so many incredible miracles. We've almost witnessed daily additions in the world sector. Just in the last two weeks, we saw 20 additions. That's more than daily additions. And also we've seen our sister's churches just growing up, like the Paris church. They had six baptisms last week. And this is after they actually sent Brussels with their best. And not only that, they actually funded that mission team in Brussels entirely from their own. Not only that, they are now 106 disciples strong. And on top of that, they will be sacrificing their leaders, the Omoses, to be going to Barcelona, Lord willing, where we're going to be having the EMC. What about other victories? Collectively, for the first 90 days, we've actually contributed 140,000 in our weekly giving. This is almost 1,600 1, pounds on a daily basis. If you think of it, it's actually, it looks quite massive. But if you look at our numbers, that's equivalent of each and every single one of us giving up two cups of coffee on a daily basis, individually. And, and what is this actually going to do? Half of our weekly giving has actually gone to support the work we're doing in the Warton, Kiev, Laviv, and also the displaced brothers and sisters in Warsaw. We've also sent money to Stockholm and also money to what I call the doubling, doubling, because they almost doubled. <laughs> and also to Berlin. And Berlin is such an incredible miracle. They are like the real wall breakers. Yes. Berlin was sent almost one and a half years ago. They've almost trebled. Wow. They've almost trebled. <laughs> they are on track of becoming the third largest church in our world sector. And this is just in less than 18 months, which is so incredible. I know you're thinking, bro, this is all incredible news. Why are we talking about giving then? OK, not everything is fine and dandy. <laughs> because there's an English word called nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless. So if you look at verse 5, it says, nevertheless, no. nevertheless. God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters. And we know in Ephesians 5.5, 5, he actually says, he groups idolaters in three categories, immoral, impurity, and greed. All that is idolatry. And you might say, bro, we are not greedy. OK, well, that's why we preach contribution every week, to drive the greed out. Amen? Because the opposite of greed is not unselfishness, but sacrificial giving. Or some might actually say, I'm not grieving. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not greedy. But the question now becomes, why are we, giving, uh, why are we missing our giving? On a weekly basis, almost 25 of us are missing their giving. And if you look for the first 90 days, this is almost 300 times misgiving. 
And you might say, I'm not greedy. I don't have a job. I just want to win the one million you mentioned about. Well, you know, with these statements, you just keep silent. You don't even answer that. You know, half of what we actually remains over here goes to doing the work here in London. It goes to fund the four regions we have, and it's not enough to be able to do that. It goes, actually, to fund what we now see as a Portuguese mission team. <laughs> Just check this out. In the, first, in the last seven days, the, the Portuguese mission team has had five additions, which is incredible. <laughs> and we've gotten Lucas, Anna, and Kane in our payroll to be able to do that piece of work. Also, later on today, we're going to be having our first ever Italian single, Italian ministry. And also with that, we had to take Olivia to be able to lead the charge on there. And not only that, we have Barcelona going on this year. We have all and the needs going to Curacao. So if we miss our giving, it really hinders the work. Just because we have collective victories, it doesn't mean you have an individual victory. At the end of the day, all of us need to have individual victories, and we need to make sure we do whatever it takes to be able to please God. Amen? Amen. The challenge is very simple. Identify in your heart where greed is starting to take a hold of. And also, as missions is coming, we don't just want to meet our missions. We want to blow out our missions. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for each and every single thing you've done for us. Just looking, Father, at the first 90 days of this year, so many souls that have come into the waters of baptisms, so many lives changed, not only just here in uh, London, Father, but just across Europe, Father, seeing how you're moving radically in Paris and in Berlin and all the world sectors, Father. We know there's just so much work to be done, Father. We want to be part of this, Father. We, we know that you want all these nations to be saved, Father. We know, Father, that you want there to be a church in Rome, Father. We know, Father, that you want a church there to be in Lisbon, Father. We know that you want a church in Barcelona, Father. And we just pray, Father, that every single thing that we collect, Father, will just be able to go so that we can make a real eternal difference, Father. Bless our giving. We love you so much. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand. As we give to God, we will worship him by singing, What a Fellowship. If you do not know the lyrics, the lyrics are on your song sheets. Song number 385. One, two, three, four. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting, we are leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning. On the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting. Arms. We are leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. We are leaning on Jesus. Leaning on Jesus. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus. Leaning on the everlasting, we are leaning on Jesus.
Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. As the trays continue to be passed around, we'll be singing Trouble Come My Way. Sometimes when we hear a biblical contribution like that, we really relate to the lyrics of this song. Yeah. Uh, sing trouble come my way. Trouble come my way. You gotta pray sometimes. You gotta pray sometimes. I just want to give a quick announcement to the Portuguese speakers. Então, para você que fala português, vamos estar lá embaixo agora para termos o culto em português no qual Renato Tria vai pregar a palavra hoje. And now we have an announcement for the Italian speakers. Uh, good morning. We're going to have uh, an announcement, of course, for the Italian speakers. Okay, so if you speak Italian, se parli italiano, ora avremo cinque minuti di pausa e ci sposteremo al piano di sopra. C'è una porta col vetro, ci sono delle scale che vi porteranno in una stanza e lì adoreremo in lingua italiana. Okay.
you gotta take, take the Lord with you, children. Everywhere you go, you gotta take the Lord with you, children. Everywhere you go, you gotta take the Lord with you, children. Everywhere you go, in the streets, in the streets, in your home, in your home. on the job, on the job. We will worship God by singing glory, glory, hallelujah. The lyrics are on the song sheets, song number 458. One, two, three. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my feet, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, our God, our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. While God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. 
Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this incredible time to be able to share the word of God. Thank you for the river of inspiration that gives us our, our direction, our purpose, and answers every single question that can be asked in this world. We ask your spirit to be with your church today. Set me aside, Father. Use me beyond words to speak to your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tell her the lesson is a going church for a coming Christ. A going church for a coming Christ. It's not just about going to church. It's about being a going church in expectation of a coming Christ. Jesus is coming to town. We understand that the world death clock says that two people die every second. And in that moment, they will face the judgment seat. They will either at that time go to heaven where there will be eternal joy, or they will go to hell. And so we've got to be not only about the fellowship, but the church in this dark world is God's battleship. We've got to be a going church for a coming Christ. We're in a fascinating study of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And we always are inspired by how the Holy Spirit is acting inside of you. I was so moved by the Good News Network, specifically the woman who had 100 visitors. 100 people that she brought out to church. See, those that didn't clap may not be saved. And that's the reason why we have a Bible study. Because if you're not fired up about people coming to church to hear the word of God, you're probably lost. You say, oh, you're talking to everybody who's visiting. No, I'm talking to some of you that claim to be disciples. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, as we study it out, that, 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 that something profound. I mean, I love the word of God. We, we are a Bible church. That means I don't, I, don't get every, I don't get a chance to preach to you my opinions. Because Bible study is hot. Your opinion is not. Bible study is hot. Your feelings are not. We are a Bible church. Bible study is hot. Your national understanding is not. We are a Bible church. You don't believe in the Bible. This church is not for you. The Bible says right here something so incredible. In Acts chapter 1, right after Jesus has given them the great commission. Remember, it's co-mission. That means we do it together. The great co-mission. He says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 10, says they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. So you got to understand this. Jesus comes back and, and, and preaches to them for 40 days. And you can read about that in verse 1 all the way down to verse 10. And, and as he preaches to them, he doesn't preach any message. He preaches the kingdom of God for 40 days. They had questions about his resurrection. 
the kingdom of God. They had questions about their marriage, the kingdom of God. They had questions about which sister or brother, who, who we're going to get married to, the kingdom of God. Does it glorify the kingdom of God? His answer was the kingdom of God. It was, it's always been the kingdom of God. The greatest institution left on this earth is not the government, it's not your school, it's not your job, it is the kingdom of God. After he preaches, he, he's going to heaven. And as they're looking intently into the sky, the Bible says they were looking intently into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from us into heaven will come back <laughs> in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Right here, they understood that as Jesus was going, they better get going. They understood that when Micah would have said in Micah 5 verse 2 that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem and the fact that Jesus came and was born in Bethlehem, they understood that when Jesus was prophesied to be not only God but also man in Isaiah 7 verse 14 that he would have fulfilled that. They understood that the prophecy said that, that, that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, a teenager. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Jesus would have fulfilled that. They understood that the Messiah was said to come and that, that miracles would be performed. What? Miracles are outside of nature. You can't explain them. You're, you're standing on the greatest miracle right now. It's called the earth, or you're sitting on it. The earth is a miracle. You can't explain away the earth. You can't tell me how it happened that it evolved. You weren't there. God was there. You can't tell me the world evolved into existence. Two, uh, there's two aspects of science, historical and observational. There is not one human that was there historically. The only one that was there was the man Jesus Christ. God was there, and he watched it come into existence. They understood Jesus would have fulfilled this. They understood that the Messiah would have said to, 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 to be willing to die a painful death on the cross. Isaiah 53, verse 6. They understand that Psalm chapter 16, verse 9 through 11, would say that the Messiah would, 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 would be resurrected on the third day. And they understood that this Jesus who came to them was that person. As they were looking, they go, that was Jesus. That was Jesus. He was the fulfillment of all the prophecies. He was the real, that, 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 the Christ came. And as he was going, they said, we better get going. So Jesus has something to take back to heaven when he comes the second time. They understood that we've got to be a going church for a coming Christ. The effectiveness of the church is when the church is going. The strength of God's church is when the church is going. The uniqueness of God's church in the Bible, the uniqueness is that they didn't just sit around and have a Sunday sermon. They were a going church. The function of the church is not community events. It's not to feed the homeless. Who cares if you feed the homeless and they go to hell? We believe in feeding the homeless. Who cares if you feed them and they don't make it to heaven? The church is not a community group, a charity group, do some charity stuff. That is not the function of the church and the Bible. The function of the church in the Bible is to be a going church, saving souls. The power of the church is when the church is going. The glory of the church is when the church is going. Your faith today is being challenged. Your faith is being challenged to put it in the word of God. Your faith, everybody has faith. Your faith is as powerful as the thing that you put it in. Where is your faith? Your faith in your money? Your faith in science? Your faith in your family? Where is your faith? Your faith is as powerful as the thing that you put it in. 
We put our faith in the word of God, the Bible. That's where my faith is. You want to know how powerful you are? Look at the place where your faith is. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We are a Bible church. Paul would say this here. The church has got to be a going church. Paul said to them there, he started this church by himself. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, something powerful. He says in verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. He says, we are God's fellow workers. He says, we are co-workers with God. He says, you do the work of God with God. You know, sometimes you do the work of God, you don't do it with God. And you stop being a co-worker. He says, in verse, I mean, it's just so convicting. He says, for we are God's fellow co-worker who you work with. Who are your, who's your, who's your main co-worker? I so love this because the word co-worker is where, is, the Greek word is sernogos. Sernogos, two words. Son, S-U-N, which means together. And ergos or ergon, which means work. Co-workers work together. He says, we are working together with Jesus. That your co-worker is God Almighty. I mean, that's a lot of power. When you take a little bit of human power and then you take the power of God, the impossible is made possible. God does the impossible. You do what is possible. God will do the impossible. <laughs> this Greek word synogos is where we get the English term synergy. Synergy. The definition of synergy is the interaction of two or more organizations or substances or agents to produce a combined greater effect than the sum total individually. Synergy. When you take two powers and put them together, you become stronger. And here, Paul says, hey, if we are going to be a going church, we got to synergize if we're going to evangelize. That means you work with God and you can evangelize. You can have synergy with God. When you hear the word of God and you've been reading the word of God, that should give you some synergy. I got to ask today, do you have synergy with God? Do you have synergy with the people of God? Even in this room, do you have synergy today with those who want to evangelize the nations and their generation? We're in a spiritual war. And the stronger we are is is evidenced by combining our efforts. That's why we are an international Christian church. And we've got to put in a great effort to see an international harvest of souls right here in London. You know, I think about the term synergy, and I first studied it out. First of all, Paul uses the word synergy so many times in the New Testament, Cernogos. He uses it about 13 times to say we've got to have synergy with one another and synergy with God. But I so love this word because when Hitler had his campaign, he used what were called draft horses. Now, draft horses are known for their power. Draft horses are known for their strength. And it was significant for Hitler during war times because they would pull his artillery, they would pull his equipment, and they would pull his his. his his, all, all the things that he would, he would pull into, into war. You take one, just one horse, you can pull 8,000 pounds. I don't know what it is in kilos, but amen, you can do the math. One horse can pull 8,000. You take two horses, of course, two horses should be able to pull 16,000. But because of God, because of the power of God, because of the principle of synergy, Two horses don't just pull 16,000. Two horses pull 24,000. Why? Because they're co-workers. They're working together. They're more powerful together than individually. But what's so powerful is 
if you take two horses that were raised on the same farm, that ate the same thing, dare we say, grew up in the same church, heard the same sermons, were raised together, two draft horses because of synergy, don't pull 20, they pull 32,000. 32,000. What's the point? I'm talking about the power of pulling for each other. I'm talking about the power in unity, the triumph of teamwork that will make the dream work. We are stronger together. We are stronger together. The rest of you, I don't know about you, but the ones that clapped, we are stronger together. We are stronger together. We are stronger together. Turn to Acts chapter 14. We are stronger together. You know, every time I see the Good News Network and I see what God is doing around the world, I'm so glad that we are in a unified movement. That every church teaches the same thing. See, we are an international Christian church. That means what you hear here, you're going to hear in every single church. We teach the exact same doctrine. We don't believe in autonomy. Autonomous churches produce autonomous disciples. We believe that we have to be unified so that we can have synergy not only with God, but with one another. And for me, I, I just think about, okay, what do I bring to the table spiritually for the battle? And I ask myself a question. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? And I'd like you to ask yourself that question. If everyone was just like me, what kind of church would we be? Kind of like a broken record. You know that tune just playing in your head right there. This question, I believe, challenges our faith. If everyone had faith like me, what kind of church would we be? If everyone had joy like me, kind of like some of you, the few of you that have joy. If everyone had joy like me, what kind of church would we be? If everyone confessed sin like me, you know, sin confession is awesome. It's not depressing. It's only depressing when you want to stay in it. It is the good news. The fact that you get to get open about your sins. You know, for me, I've been having these crazy evil thoughts at night sometimes. You can't do it. You're terrible. Why don't you just look at some impurity? I'm like, wow, God is moving so powerful, and I'm having evil thoughts. I normally don't have them. But late at night, just just an evil thought here or there. And I thought, no, that's awesome. I can get open about evil thoughts. That's awesome, because God will forgive me. He will forgive me. If everyone prayed like me. What kind of church would we be? Remember the title of the lesson is a going church for a coming Christ. A going church for a coming Christ. You know, I'm so inspired by all the miracles in the European world sector. I was inspired by finding out that Serge and Victoria are now dating in the kingdom of God in the church in Poland. So God is moving all around the European world sector, and Serge wants to be in the full-time ministry. So we'll see what the Lord does with Serge and Victoria, what kind of synergy they add to the forceful advancement of the European churches. We studied Paul out last week, and we remember so many things about Paul. I won't go into all of them. You can listen to last week's sermon, but we're going to be looking at chapter 14, 15, and 16 today. Of course, Paul is the main leader from here going for, the the word Paul means small, (laughs) small guy with a big message. (laughs) Um, Paul, Paul, his his, his Roman name was Saul. So he's Roman legally. He had citizenship in Rome. He's Greek culturally, but he's saved spiritually. He would move the gospel all through Turkey. Paul was very cultured. You got to be cultured if you're going to be a going church. You got to know what's going on. The Bible says he was cultured. How do we know that? Well, Paul quotes Epimendes in Titus chapter 1, verse 12. This was a secular poet, a secular thinker. 
He says, by quoting him, he says, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. He, he, he says the word Cretans, okay, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 12. And obviously we learn from that that there is a such thing as cultural sins. There are certain cultures that struggle with sins that other cultures don't struggle with as much. We all fall short of the glory of God, so no one's better. But certain cultures struggle with certain sins. Certain cultures come to church late. And you know who you are, and you, you even tell other cultures it's okay. You don't come on time. Certain cultures don't clap on time. You're trying to, you're snapping off and you're messing up worship. But Paul understood who Epimendes was. Why? He quotes his work, which is called Critica. He also quoted Erastus in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, who was a poet, and he quotes one of his poems, which would be called Phenomena. So Paul was very cultured. Dare we say, you've got to be cultured if you're going to evangelize the nations. You've got to know what's going on. Paul was a major Jew historically, trained by Gamaliel. But again, he was a disciple spiritually, trained by Jesus. You remember that last week, he got personally trained by Jesus. And we remember in the church last week, I do have to address this, if we're going to be a growing church, we've got to have great diversity. Now, we remember last week, we talked about all the different leaders that were in the church, Acts chapter 13. Remember, there was a guy, Simon, called Niger. Niger means black guy, meaning you got to have black people in the church. I'm glad black people made it in the Bible. They, they don't matter in other places and social circles. They may not matter, but in the Bible, they mattered a little bit. That's awesome. Okay? And so he becomes a disciple. Now, remember, Simon from Niger was a guy who was forced to carry the cross. Okay? He was forced. To, that means he was tough. That means you need to have leaders that are tough in the church if we're going to be a going church. You've got to have leaders that are tough. You know, it's sad that Jesus isn't seen as tough. Jesus is tough. Jesus is tough. His first sermon, they tried to kill him. They thought he was awesome when he said he was saved and he was a, he was a glory. When, they, when He said glowing things, but then when he got real down to it, they wanted to throw him off a cliff and he walked right through because nothing can stop Jesus and nothing can stop Jesus' church. So Simon most likely was tough, but he most likely was passionate. Why? Because he carried the cross of Jesus. You know what that did to him? He actually carried, we talk about, we got to deny, like spiritually, he literally carried the cross. He would be passionate. You need people in the church that are passionate. People that are passionate. We remember that Lucius from Cyrene was also from Africa. He most likely converted him. So you need tough guys, you need passionate guys. And, and, and Lucius from Cyrene most likely was converted by this guy. Cyrene. He, he, he most likely was just grateful. You need grateful people in church. You need grateful people. People that are just grateful to be disciples. We remember last week that Manane, who had been brought up with Herod uh, uh, Antipas, the guy that killed John the Baptist. I mean, he was a guy who grew up in an atheist home, but he was a leader in God's kingdom. Most likely, he was clever. You need clever people in the church. And so you see the great diversity that's in the Bible from Acts chapter 13. And we say all that to say after they preach, they got a little bit of persecution, and we get chapter 14. Okay, Acts chapter 14. Point number one, great preaching. If we're going to be a going church, we got to have great preaching. Not good preaching, great preaching. You can't give a good sermon. You got to have great preaching. Acts chapter 14, verse 1. This is modern-day Turkey, city known, uh, city known as Koine today. It says in verse, four, uh, verse 1, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas, you see the change in leadership Paul is leading, Paul and Barnabas, about 47 A.D., again, Asia Minor or Turkey, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. So we see that the usual way to get the church going for Paul was to go to a synagogue. Synagogue does not mean building. It means a group of men. 10 to 12 men constituted a synagogue. Dare we say the way you get the church going is you got to go after men. When you get the men to step up and lead and you make it your custom to preach to the men, to preach to the men, to say, come out of your synagogue. Come out of your synagogue. Come into the kingdom. It was his custom to go after the men. Today, God 
is talking to the men. And don't worry, the women are listening. It was his custom. Says, as usual, there they spoke so effectively. The Holy Spirit adds the word effective. That means you can speak and it can be ineffective. They spoke so effectively that a small number of Jews and Gentiles believe. No, it says a great number. A great number of Jews and Gentiles believe. That means people that were raised with the Bible, Jews who were taught the Torah from five years old, and Gentiles who had no faith in God. Both came together for the common purposes of God. That means the message that can change a religious guy can change an atheist guy. Same message. What is your purpose? Why are you here? Why are you on this earth? Do you know? God knows. It says they had great numbers of people who believed. But check this out. After this great preaching, it says, but the Jews who refuse to believe stirred up Gentiles and did what? Poison their minds against the brothers. So right here we find that right after great preaching comes great poisoning. See, if you're a disciple and you've had some great preaching, trust, there's going to become some great poisoning right after. If you're a young Christian and you've been baptized this year, oh, trust me, God has converted you. There's been some great preaching that can call you out of your sins, but there'll be some great poisoning. People that want you to come. And see, see, Satan is a street fighter. He'll use your mom. He'll use your dad. He'll threaten you. Your parents will threaten you. Honor, honor me. The Bible says honor God over everything, not honor your parents. He'll use your family. Haven't you read Luke chapter 14? He says, yeah, you got to love me more than your mother, brother, sister, even your own life. Are you with me right here? That means if you let your parents talk you out of the kingdom, you worship them and you don't worship God. You can't let them poison you. It's sad that we live in a generation where parents won't stop their kids from the club, but they'll stop them from becoming true disciples. They're not your kids. They're God's kids. He just let you have them for, for a while to see how you're going to raise them. You didn't create them. God created them. I don't believe my son is my son. I believe God gave me my son. That's the reason why I asked God for him. I prayed to God, God, give me a son on my birthday. Before finding the sex, we did not find out the sex. I prayed and fasted for a son. Michael Adrian was born, born at 6 a.m. on my birthday. Don't tell me that's not a miracle. My son was born on my birthday. It's not my son. He's God's son. He gave him to me. My job is to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. As a parent, your job is to instruct your children in the ways of the Lord. I was in raised religions. Nobody taught me. My parents didn't hurt. They hurt me. They abused me. They did all this stuff. Maybe you're running the Victim Olympics. I can set you free today. Maybe you're running the Victim Olympics. We got a lot of that nowadays. Everybody wants to talk about how bad they had it, how tough they had it. Trust me, I can run them with you. I understand this race. I ran it for a while. The Victim Olympics. Victimhood has currency nowadays. You want, to tell, you want me to tell you who has the most control of the world? The greatest victim. It happened to hashtag... Me too. I'm the greatest victim. Da -da 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 -da. Let me tell you how bad I've been sinned against. How about Jesus Christ? How about Jesus Christ? If we're going to be a going church, there's got to be great preaching. The church is a reflection of the Jesus you preach or don't preach. Your Bible talk is a reflection of the Jesus you preach or don't preach. Your wife is a reflection of the Jesus you preach to her or the Jesus you don't preach. You believe that? What are the signs of great preaching? I believe the signs of great preaching you find in the Bible. It just produces more great preaching. If your great preaching is not producing more great preaching, it's not great preaching. Paris had six baptisms last week. Amsterdam had two baptisms last week. 
Kevin and Sandra are going to take over the church in Paris. Anthony and Cassidy over there in Poland, and they're preaching the word over there right now. <laughs> Anthony went from somebody who didn't even believe in himself to leading arguably our most powerful second church in Europe. Paul Bussari went from being somebody who didn't want anything to do with God. He's in Birmingham right now preaching. <laughs> Rebecca's in Birmingham preaching. The Portuguese ministry has had five baptisms in seven weeks. And they got a baptism today. And Olivier went from being a professional boxer wanting to box for England to saying, I don't want to fight physically for England. I want to fight spiritually for God. He's upstairs right now fighting for the Italians because we're going to plant a church in Rome. It's not just going to be a tourist destination. It's going to, be, it's going to have God's spirit and God's church there. Great preaching produces more great preaching. You know, I so love the story of this incredible speaker who gets up and he preaches. And he was a world-renowned orator and, you know, this kind of junior, junior guy had his leader there. And he goes, hey, boss, did you hear that guy preach? And, 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 and the, the boss goes, yes, I heard him preach. And the, and the young guy goes, what'd you think of his sermon? It was, it was amazing. And the leader goes, it was funny. It was passionate. It was, it was rational. It had scientific depth. It was cultured. It was cool. It was convicting. But it failed. Because it didn't call me to do something great. What is your vision for your life? As a disciple, is it 2020 more? What's the record number of visitors you brought to church? Do you even know? Do you even think about it? I want to challenge you to have some great preaching, to set a record this year for the number of people you brought to church and you helped become disciples. What is your vision? What is your vision? Now, we remember, this is, this is powerful because the fact that they went to Iconium, you got to understand, in Acts chapter 13, verse 50, they actually got kicked out. Okay? They got kicked out of the city they were in for preaching. So if you get kicked out of a city for preaching, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would stop preaching probably. But they go and they keep preaching. And they go and they got kicked out of a synagogue. You know, for me, if I if you go to one synagogue in one city and they kick you out, I'm probably not gonna go to the synagogue in the next city. They go to the synagogue in the next city. That means great preaching is resilient. It's resilient. They kick you out of one section of campus, go to another one. They kick you out of another section on that campus, go to another one. They kick you out of that section, you go to another one. And they kick you off that campus, go to another campus. You just keep preaching. Because great preaching is resilient. It's resilient. You don't preach because you want the results. You preach because you want to glorify God. And whether they listen or fail to listen, they'll know that a prophet has been among them. They'll know. They'll know. You can lie to everybody. You can't lie to yourself. You can lie to everybody. You can't lie to yourself. The truth hits everybody. The truth will set you free. It may set you off at first, but it will set you free when you tell yourself the truth, the truth about yourself. That's what scared me about this church when I first came to it. It was true. I remember going to Wednesday night, men's night. The preacher got up there and he goes, point number one, pornography is from the devil. I was sitting in the front. I had just come from a porn adult store across the street where we were meeting. Have you ever gone swimming and you get into the water and it gets right here and you, you know that feeling like that? That's how I felt the entire time at church. I remember the guy that brought me to church, he was looking at me, he goes, you okay? I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. They go, okay, we'll take a five minute fellowship. I went outside. I left. I was like, man, these people are telling the truth. When I got outside, there was a guy who, who went to the church, but he was outside too. And he was smoking a cigarette. So I knew he wasn't a Christian. And um, 
and he's smoking a cigarette. And as I come out the door, it's, he's smoking a cigarette and he just looks over at me and goes, challenging, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is <laughs> challenging. I said, yeah, it is challenging, man. Woo! They're preaching, they're preaching the demons out of me. So if you're feeling like that today, you're in the right place. But what happens after the great preaching? Great poisoning. Because that's the result of great preaching, great poisoning. Wars are not only fought with weapons, they're fought with words. And they understood the greatest way to discourage the disciples, one of them, is with words. Weaponizing words. Man, these disciples have unsuspecting minds. Let's poison their minds. Let's poison their minds. Let's, let's get them to get sucked into racial idolatry. I mean, that's the world we live in now. You go on YouTube and they're, they're, everybody's got some way to poison your mind. Let's pit women against men and make women think they're smarter. Let me tell you something, women. You're not smarter than men. And men, you're not smarter than women. Don't, I hope you haven't been poisoned by the media. I hope you don't think you're better than, sister. Now, you can say amen to me today. God knows your heart. I hope you don't think you're better than. They didn't call you to go to World War I or World War II. They called the men. And the fact that women think that shows the cowardness of the men in this world. The cowardness, just cowardly men. Chicken. Afraid of what people think about you. Putting your culture above your calling. Where are the men and the women? I hope this church is full of women. I'm talking women. Women that are sensitive, easily hurt, cry all the time, emotional. <laughs> women, beautiful women. You know, women get emotional. <laughs> women, man. I mean, it's in the Bible. The Bible says when the women saw Jesus, they said they were afraid yet filled with joy. <laughs> How do you do that? Afraid and filled with joy. I mean, that's, that's for the sisters. That's the reason why brothers that act like that, we need to have a little discipling time. The world wants to poison you against great preaching. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, New Living Translation, a wise person is hungry for knowledge while the fool feeds on trash. Feeding on gossip, online gossip. We got people that right now putting up a YouTube against me. <laughs> He's a <the> trick. <laughs> and then we got disciples that go after again, once after you look at your internet pornography, you go and you look at it. And you feed on that trash. <laughs> Proverbs 2, verse 6 says, It is the Lord who gives wisdom. From him come knowledge and understanding. He says you can. You, 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 can, you, can, you can feed on the truth or you can feed on trash. The truth is the Bible. Online gossip is trash. Online gossip is trash. It is trash. Your mind is, is, is a well of your thoughts. And you think about wells that supply, even in this country, wells would supply the village. Pure water. All you gotta do is contaminate the water Contaminate, and you contaminate everybody yeah. in the village. You poison everybody. Your mind is the well of your thoughts. That means you got to have awesome thoughts. Are you with me right there? You got to go on a diet against deadly thinking. You got to go on a diet against deadly thinking. You got to stop tolerating junk ideas that come sneaking up on you at like midnight snacks. These junk ideas. Your money is best used to evangelize the nations. Your talent is best used to evangelize the nations. Your company won't save as many people as your convictions will. You got to train your mind to crave conviction, not compromise. Your brain has got to have a, 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 an awesome fitness hobby, and it can't be jumping to conclusions. Pulling up that old baggage. Mind poison. You need to tell your brain, no more pessimism. 
No more, pet, no more pessimism. And your brain speaks back. Well, let me just binge watch one more time for closure, please. Just need to have closure. Just want to be negative for a little bit longer. I just need closure. No, you need a conviction. Atheism is poison. It's poison. It's garbage. It's trash. It's trash. What's atheism done? What university says atheists have atheists done? What's it done for us? What are we going to go tell go Hamas and everybody you need the word of atheism to heal up everything over there? What are you going to tell a mom? Her kid's stabbing somebody. Let's talk about let's atheism. Let's come over here. And disciples still struggling with atheism. It's because you've been poisoned. Nationalism. There's no nation better than any other nation. Don't get on your high horse. Every nation's got some real dark sin. Black people, white people, Chinese people, Asian people, mixed race people, every people. We all fall short of the glory of God. There's not one nation better than the other. Don't let the media poison your minds against the nation so you have no love for them and no compassion. And you make your little national decision instead of a conviction that comes from the scripture. Feminism. All I'll say about this is, because I've studied it out, feminist belief is, has, is rooted in, in witchcraft. They hate Christianity. Many feminists, early feminist writers, believed in Luciferianism. Yeah, Lucifer, literally Satan. The women's liberation movement in the 60s believed in, it's just godless, godlessness. I hope you haven't been poisoned by feminism. Poisoning the mind. Stop, stop great preaching. You know what they're doing in Scotland? If a guy comes to you and he's got a wig on and a dress like uh, the sister, and you go, hey, man, how you doing? You, that wig doesn't look good on you. You can go to jail for that. They're trying to make that a law. Hate speech. No, that's great speech. That's not hate speech. That's great speech. Praise God the NHS is going to stop giving our kids puberty blockers. Where there's great preaching, there'll be great poisoning. What are you going to choose? You're going to continue to love great preaching or allow your minds to be poisoned? Check this out. It says in verse 3, so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking calmly, rationally, kindly, boldly for themselves for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do what? Miraculous signs and wonders. Where there's great preaching, if we're going to be a going church, we need great miracles. Great miracles. Great financial miracles. Great numeric miracles. We need great miracles. We can't just preach about it. We've got to be about it. Are you with me right here? We need great miracles. Awesome individuals that want to go into full-time ministry. Yeah. You know, I, I got to lift up our, our brother Rico. He's leaving tomorrow. I believe it's tomorrow or Tuesday. He's going to go. He's going to be in, in, in Lisbon to preach the word for the next couple of weeks right there to continue to get our work going over there. And it's so awesome because he, he didn't really have faith. He had no dream. Now he's not only got a girlfriend, but a dream. Sometimes it's a miracle just to get an awesome girlfriend that loves Jesus Christ. I mean, we think that's funny. I tried it. I went to every nightclub, every university, every party, every business meeting. I didn't find a woman like Michelle Williamson because I couldn't find her. God got her for me. Beautiful women are Christian women. Beautiful women are Christian women. And beautiful men. Actually, I probably shouldn't say beautiful nowadays. Awesome men. Urgh, men, square jawline. They're Christian men, amen? It's a miracle to be a man and a Christian nowadays. But great miracles. Great miracles. Then the Bible says, they continue to preach, and then it says in verse 7, uh, it says they continue to preach the good news. Okay? So after the poisoning, they get some persecution a little bit, and then they go and they continue to preach the good news. Then it says in verse 8, chapter 14, it says, in Lystra, 
uh, there was a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth who had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Now, I find it interesting that they were watching. And then Paul and Barnabas, they do a great miracle. These people were observant. They were observant because they stopped being servants. All it took was faith to get this guy healed. You know, our church can't be full of people that are observant. But people that are servants. You can't just watch the miracles happening. you got to be the miracle happening. We can't just sit around. Every one of you can reach out to somebody that I could. If I reach out to them, they will never become a Christian. But if you reach out to them, I mean, they'll fall in love. I mean, my wife, she could talk to anybody. She probably could talk to Biden, uh, the leaders of Hamas. She probably could talk to all of them and convince them to become Christians. I don't know. I, she, just, she just got a way about it, talking to people. But we all have a purpose, and God wants to use us all individually. We can't just be observant. we got to be servants. And I so love their heart. Great preaching is humble. Look at this here. It says, they go, the gods have come to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was chief speaker. Okay? The priest Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he had a crowd. Uh, he, he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifice to them. If I was Paul and I was the main speaker and a huge crowd like Wembley Stadium, they're like, ah. I, I may go, Barnabas, let, let them worship us just for like, just for a little while till we get like, let's just get that thousand baptized and then we'll tell them we're not, we're not Zeus and Hermes. How about that? You can tell, you know, I, I, I lived in the urban community at one point in my life. Um, but they were humble. They take no glory. They refuse glory. They refuse idolatry. They refuse it. They refuse to let their people worship them. They refuse to say, oh, I'm, look how awesome I am. Are you with me right here? Great preaching refuses to take the glory. You give it all to God. And of course, what happens after they call them gods? It says in verse 19, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul. They go from being called gods to being called frauds. That's how fickle people are. Monday, awesome, seeking God. Tuesday, Word of God, you're amazing. Friday, discipleship, pew, they're out of here. <laughs> People are so fake. Yeah. Says they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. I mean, how'd you like that? Stoned him and dragged him. Have you ever studied out stoning? Have you ever studied how the Greeks did it, how the Romans did it, how everybody, the Persians were the worst. The Persians would bury you up to your waist so you could see it happening. Get your arms like this, and you're buried up to your, poof, and you just poof, get pelted with rocks until you die. That's stoning. It says they stone, they stone Paul. What are you doing, Barnabas? Where's Barnabas at? Maybe he wasn't as tough. It says they stone, they stone Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. I mean, if you're Barnabas at that point and Paul gets stoned, you're like, bro, I think you should lead the movement right there, bro. I mean, you're pretty awesome. I would be very humble to Paul. Why? Well, look what happens after they stone him. But after the disciples had gathered around him, let me tell you something. You know what can strengthen you if you've been beat up by the world? When all the disciples gather around you and say, bro, you're our leader. Bro, keep preaching. Bro, keep going. Bro, you can do it. Bro, get up. Stand up, bro. We're with you. 
heart. And so all the Christians, all the disciples get that encouragement going. And they gather around and they encourage him. And the Bible said, like, like, just like the Incredible Hulk. It's just, it's, he got, I can just see Paul just get, wiping the blood. Pushing it out of his face. A little bit of a struggle. And he stands up. And says he got up. He looks at the disciples. And he goes back into the city. He goes back into the city. But it says the next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. <laughs> Paul goes, I'm done. Dun, 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 dun. See, you couldn't stop me, but I'm, I gotta go now. I gotta get another city. I gotta go to. I wanna get killed here, being too tough. See, our second point is greater haters. If we're gonna be a going church for a coming Christ, we've gotta have great preaching. But where there's great preaching, there's great poisoning. You got to be greatly resilient. Yeah. Greatly. You got to, this great humility. Don't let people worship you. There'll be great, great, great persecution. The haters will get greater. The greater the preaching, the greater the hater. We see it right here. And the hate doesn't stop in chapter 14. Look at chapter 15. First, the hate comes from outside the kingdom. Now, check this out. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch. These guys traveled 300 miles with their criticism. These are disciples. See, if God can't stop you out of the kingdom, he'll try to stop you in the kingdom. He'll try to use people in the kingdom to stop you. Bro, you going on a mission? Bro, bro, you know. These dream killers. Dream killers. Oh, we don't have any dream killers in London. Dream killers in, in Europe. I hope, wife, you're not a dream killer. You know, just too much. I hope, husband, you're not a dream killer. She's like, uh, bro, uh, is, do we have a dream? I, I know you like me. I, I'm not your dream. Oh. Are we going to do something other than sit at home and get fat? Yes, I said the word fat. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Greater the haters. I may get some great hate after this. Amen. These were guys that were disciples, but they brought, they brought, they brought law into, into salvation. This is 49 AD. I like how God, I like the Bible, man. The Bible's awesome. I mean, from 29 AD, the church started. And then we get to 49 AD, arguably the most challenging time. This is where a church split could happen. Because it was a very contentious situation, this issue with circumcision. Circumcision is cutting away the skin on the male private part. Okay? It's, it's circumcision. So they try to say you got to be circumcised. Okay? They say you got to be circumcised. These are disciples are saying this. And they probably had quiet reservations because they come from Judaism. But you can't add your old religious ideas to the new wine of the kingdom of God. You can't bring this old wine into new wine wineskin. And this could happen to disciples. You came out of the church uh, that taught some things that are inaccurate biblically, but you still kind of want to match, match them up with, with the kingdom. So how can we speak in tongue? That's how it looks to me. I'm like, bro. That's why we have first principles. Tongues had a purpose. Now we have all the completed word of God. The Bible says tongues will cease. First Corinthians chapter 13. The word is teleos. It's the complete thing. When we get the complete thing, what's the complete thing? The word of God. We, need, we got the Bible now. We don't need these, these things like this. Well, how can you, can you get... Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be... I mean, I can see here the song service. Thank you, law, for loving me, and thank you, law, for blessing me. Thank you, law, for making me whole. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the law of Moses. <laughs> no. Can you imagine? I have decided to follow Moses. I have. 
You ever read the law? Don't wear a piece of blue yarn and a yellow piece of yarn and don't have a bunion if you're from Africa. Don't you, I mean, oh my goodness, you can't live up to the law. It's impossible. You can't stitch up the veil. You can't stitch, the veil has been open. We have to be baptized as true disciples. That's good enough. That's good enough. We can't fix up anything with salvation. You gotta become a true disciple. You gotta be baptized as a disciple. Then you gotta go make disciples. That, that, that's, that's what God came to do. Your purpose is to make disciples. To make disciples. We don't want to, most people don't think that this is the heart of, this is what the church is here for. They think the church is just a community organization. That's not the church. The church is, is, is a going church. We can't fix the work that's already been completed by Jesus on the cross. Right? And Israel, Israel, spiritual Israel is not literal Israel. Spiritual Israel is the church. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. The church is Israel. We're not Zionists. We're evangelists. Are you with me here? I hope you haven't let the media poison you. Can you imagine going down to Holland, fixing up the Rembrandt with your box of crayons? Then head over to England invoke some editorial rights over the Magna Carta, you know, got to fix the Magna Carta. Then head on over to America, got to get rid of, you know, got to help out the Constitution there. You can't add to the masterpiece that Jesus has already formed. You can't fix the perfect picture of Christ. You can't redact the righteousness of God. You can't erase the message of God's grace and add anything to it. You can't add Catholicism to it. You can't add Pentecostalism to it. You can't add Muslim militarism to the call of God. You can't add anything to the message. You can't. And of course, James, the brother of Jesus, makes a decision. He goes, it's my judgment, guys. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. A lot, a lot of people in our former fellowship, they go, yeah, but he's a human. The Bible says he made up with his own judgment. Well, I, for those of you that are watching, uh, in verse 28, See, this is what the central leader makes sure that he's in line with. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 28, the Bible says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything. See, the central leader will always make a central decision that agrees with the Holy Spirit. And we know God's Holy Spirit is to evangelize the nations of one generation. This is God's supreme court, the Holy Spirit. Number three, great discipling. For time's sake, I'll shorten it. We get to chapter 16, and it says, He came to Derby and to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish, Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Shout out to all the mixed race people in the audience right there. Amen. You made the Bible too. There you go. There you go. The brothers, uh, the brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. You know, that's what it takes to be a going church. You got to be spoken well of in two di different churches. You got to be spoken well under two different leadership styles. And because he had such a great reputation, it says Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he what? Circumcised him. I love, I love, God is so funny, guys. The church almost splits over circumcision. The next chapter, and Paul, we don't need to be circumcised. We need to be baptized. We don't need to do it, and they make a decision. Oh, it's my judgment. Oh, nobody needs to be circumcised. We just need to be baptized in Jesus' name, and that's enough. We don't need to add to the word of God. We don't need to, okay, Timothy, you need to get circumcised. God is always going to get your heart. And our third point is great discipling. What is great discipling? This is Paul's second missionary journey. What is great discipling? It's willing to be discipled on disputable matters. 
Timothy could admit, like, hey, bro, you just got through saying, technically, biblically, I don't have to be circumcised. But Paul's like, yeah, but if we're going to win more people to Christ that are Jews, and you're going to be with me, I may have to disciple you on things that are disputable biblically, that you actually have the right to go against me and stay a disciple and stay in the church. You guys following where I'm going? What's convicting is Titus was there, too. But Titus isn't mentioned as being at the Jerusalem Council. You have to go to Galatians 2, verse 3 through 5 to see that. Why didn't Titus get circumcised? Because I'm, I'm, I'm talking about you. You know, isn't it funny? You start getting discipled on something, you start asking why this guy didn't happen to this guy. Yeah. You ever done that one? Yeah. It's like, why, why you ask him to do that, but you didn't ask him to do that? Because yeah. God is after your heart to find out if you believe in great discipling. And besides, Timothy was called to be to circumcise to win more souls. Yeah. Titus was challenged on circumcision because they were false brothers. Paul goes, when you got false apostles trying to get us to do something that's disputable, I'm not, I don't care about them. But when you got people that could be come baptized, if you, get, if, you, if you let me disciple you on this, if you let me, I never forget. I mean, one of the reasons that I became a preacher, I remember Kip told me, my leader, he says, bro, we got to talk about something. Something that can stop the advancement of the gospel. An issue in your life, young man. And I, I got together with him, and I was scared, man. I was like, man, Michelle must have called him. <laughs> like, Damn, what did Michelle say? And I started thinking about parenting. I started thinking about all this stuff. And he goes, Michael, you bite your nails. You cannot bite your nails in Jesus' name. <laughs> I almost got mad. I was like, bro, where is that in the scriptures? You know. <laughs> but I, but I, but I, can you be discipled on disputable matters? How about it? If your hairstyle is blocking people from becoming Christians? <laughs> I said, bro, I know, I know, I know. It looks cool, but bro. Now, sometimes your, 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 your hairstyle makes you go, ooh, is this a preacher? I like Harry right there. Yeah. <laughs> Harry's been circumcised. I don't know, Harry. We may have to revisit. Your calling in the Lord, Timothy. And a scale of 1 to 10, how are you doing in your discipling relationship? And a scale of 1 to 10, how would your discipleship partner say you're doing? How are you? Are you a cat or a dog? You know cats. Can't find them. Nowhere they can't find them. That's why they got the analogy, herding cats. You ever try to herd some cats? You can't even find one of them. Dogs are just come right up. Lick your hand. Roll over. Jump. Sit down. They do it. Whatever. I'm not calling you a dog. I'm just, you get the point. How's your discipleship? How's your relationship? Is it a joy to disciple you? Do people got to pray before they get with you? Is it a joy? Do you have synergy? Are you coworkers? Are you and your discipleship partner helping the church go? Does your relationship glow? Or do other people see your discipleship and they go, no? We're not going to get all of Europe if we don't have great discipling. You may have to get corrected on some things that you can argue against biblically. And then by doing that, you stop many people from becoming Christians. Because you don't believe in great discipling. And lastly, great Eurovision. I'll preach about it next week, but at the end of chapter 16, we see the churches start in Europe. Now, Michelle and I have been tasked with leading all the singles in the entire movement. And I so love how the gospel came to Europe. Because the gospel came to Europe, the Bible says Paul had a vision. And that's our last point, great Eurovision. I hope you don't think Eurovision is a TV show. No, Eurovision is you. You need to have Eurovision for Europe. What's your vision? The Bible says Paul had vision for Asia. You know, 
cracks me up. We preach a sermon like this, and brothers come up to me and talk about some other country. I'm like, what about Europe, bro? Sisters, yeah, I can't wait to go to America. We got churches in America. How about Europe? And what's so powerful is that when God says it's time to start Europe, God didn't start Europe with a white man, not a black man, not with a white girl, not with a black girl. God didn't start Europe with a campus student. You know who God started Europe with? A single professional. An Asian businesswoman. Highlighting that when I got baptized as a single professional, that when Michelle got baptized as a single professional, God had Eurovision before we did. What's your vision for Europe? I got the demographics. I can't read them all to you of where everybody is here in Europe. The Hungarians are in Barnet. The Eastern Europeans are in East London. Are we going to go to Latvia? Are we going to go to Lithuania? Are we going to go to, are we hungry for Hungary? Are we going to go Czech Republic? Are we going to evangelize all of Europe? When Jesus comes back, will, will he be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servants? Are we going to get Oxford? We got not four regions, bro. We got six, by the way. Seven with Portugal. What's your vision for Europe? I want to challenge you. Kill your dream for God's dream. Kill your dream for God's dream. And if you don't want to kill it, make sure your dream is in align with God's dream. Start your company in Poland. Start your company somewhere we don't have a church. Let's make a movie somewhere over there. Let's, let's glorify God with our talents. You didn't create your talents. God gave them to you. Use them for the glory of God. We'll continue our study next week, and we'll stop it there. You say, well, what do all these points spell? Absolutely nothing. Which is exactly what you got to be if we're going to be a going church for a coming Christ. You got to make yourself nothing. I love you, and to God be all the glory. Okay, church, you remember what the title of today's sermon is? What is it? So, are we ready to go? Great, let's tell Jesus that. Let's get up on our feet as we sing. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Send me God. Here I am, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Send me God. For your son. For your son, Lord. our Portuguese ministry. <laughs> Today is another bad day for the devil. Yeah. I present to you Shaje Graciela Oliveira. Yeah. She's a national from Brazil, and she's come to be baptized today. Um, I'm so proud of Shaje. She's uh, wrestled a lot with the scriptures to overcome past deep hurts and um, hatred, and also overcome many false teachings. And she has signed up on the Portugal mission team. 
And I'm going to present now Claudia Mira, who's going to share. And after that, uh, Jade is going to share. And Thais, our new sister, is going to ask the question. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, family. <laughs> Boa tarde, família. Um, Jade, estou muito feliz por ti hoje. Um, uh, você transformou bastante. Oh. <laughs> você transformou bastante e eu estou muito orgulhosa de você. I'm very proud of you. Uh, uma das coisas que eu admiro bastante de você é One of the I in you é uma forma que você quer pôr a palavra de Deus em prática na sua vida. The way you the Bible in your life. E você quer procurar na Escritura para pôr em prática o que, é que a Escritura diz, não o que, é que as pessoas dizem. And you really search for the word and not what, what people say. E eu penso sobre a mulher samaritana de João 4. And I think about the Samaritan woman in John 4. E ela quando viu ou teve a conversa com Jesus, ela tra transformou. And when Amen. she spoke to Jesus, she was transformed. E você não só decidiu a uh, uh, ser batizado hoje, mas também compartilhou fé com suas amigas que estão a estudar Bíblia atualmente. Amen. And you didn't just decide to get baptized today, but you shared faith with your friends who are also studying the Bible today. E a escritura que eu quero compartilhar contigo, a escritura que eu quero, quero compartilhar contigo, and I want to share a scripture with you. é no João 17, versículo 26. In John 17, 26. De um só homem, ele criou todas as raças humanas. From para one que, man, he created all the nations. Para que viveram na terra. So that they inhabit the earth. Um, antes de criar os povos. Before creating all the people. Uh, Deus marcou para onde eles irão uh, morar e quanto tempo ficaram lá. God determined the times and places. E é incrível para ver da forma que Deus determinou onde você vai saber a verdade. And it's incredible that God determined the place you will receive the truth. E o lugar que vais morar e vai tornar um discípulo e impactar muitas pessoas na sua vida. And the place you will live and impact people to become disciples. E hoje vais entrar na luz e tem muitas pessoas que vão precisar de tua ajuda. And today you're going to enter into the light and there's going to be so many people that will need your help. E mal posso esperar para batizar muitas pessoas contigo. Amen. And I can't wait to baptize other people together. E para ver você continuar a buscar Deus com todo o teu coração. And I can't wait for you to seek God with all of your heart. Continuar a buscar Deus com todo o teu coração, assim podes viver dentro do plano dele todos os dias da tua vida. And to live inside of the plan of God. Amen. E eu também quero dizer mais coisas. <laughs> Mas eu vou deixar compartilhar porque esse é o dia especial para você e Deus. But it, this is your special day with God. Eu te amo bastante. I love you a lot. Okay. And now Jari will share. <laughs> sim, sim. Boa tarde a todos. É, eu quero agradecer primeiro a Deus, é, porque sem Ele eu não estaria aqui. Antes de começar os estudos, eu achava que eu era uma discípula. Aí a gente iniciou os estudos e as minhas amigas me mostravam na escritura a verdade. E então eu percebi que eu não era uma discípula. And throughout the studies, my friends showed me the truth and I saw I wasn't a true disciple. E também eu aprendi que para ser salva, eu precisaria me tornar uma discípula. And I understood that to be saved, I would have to become a disciple. <laughs> é, eu quero agradecer todas as irmãs. <laughs> I want to thank all the sisters que estiveram comigo, que estudou, que compartilhou a fé. Que compartilharam do seu passado, de suas fraquezas. E assim elas me ajudaram a perceber que eu precisava entrar na luz. E eu mal posso esperar para entrar para ser batizada, entrar na luz. I can't wait to be baptized and enter into the light. <laughs> e fazer discípulos. And to make disciples. É, é, 
é, que eu possa alcançar outras mulheres como essas mulheres me alcançou. <risos> Cláudia Mira, eu quero te falar que você me inspira, que eu acho que você é uma pessoa muito, muito, muito forte. E você me inspira muito. E Maria, você também me inspira. E Maria, você me inspira muito. Muito obrigada. Jade, você acredita que Jesus Cristo é o Filho de Deus, veio à Terra, viveu uma vida sem pecado, morreu na cruz pelos seus pecados, ressuscitou ao terceiro dia e agora está sentado à direita de Deus? Sim, eu acredito. Qual é a sua boa confissão? Jesus Cristo é o Senhor. Sua boa confissão, agora podemos batizá-la em nome do Pai, do Filho e do Espírito Santo. Você receberá o perdão dos seus pecados, o dom do Espírito Santo e será adicionado ao reino de Deus que é a igreja. After witnessing another miracle, we're going to sing one final song if we can all preach the aisles as we sing, Go and Make Disciples.
you are dismissed.